Commerce, and along with uh, the Oceanside and S uh, excuse me, the Oceanside and Carlsbad Chambers, we're very pleased to put this on today. And I have with us the CEO at the Oceanside Chamber, uh, Scott Ashton. Thanks, Scott, for being here. And the COO from the Carlsbad Chamber, Tony Padron. Tony, thanks for being here. So uh, again, thank you for joining us tonight. Our <coughs> moderator for this evening will be Steve Harrington. Steve uh, works for Pacific Western Bank, is a commercial banker there, and he will be leading us through our questions and, and well, you'll be leading us through the answers, but he'll, he'll cut you off and give you the rules and all those things, and uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. Thank you, Brad. Okay, so the ground rules for tonight. <laughs> and the audience, you know, I, I know there's a big crew here, but we're listening to them, not cheering and clapping and all that, if you don't mind. Anyway, uh, we're going to start out with, we have five questions for you. The first one is an introductory question, which is a brief introduction about yourself, what makes you qualified to serve on the board of directors for the hospital district, and share a bit of your experience with the hospital. Um, with the center in the past, including partners, patients, staff members, your involvement. And if you need me to repeat, that'd be more than happy to. But that'll be two minutes each. And our good friend sitting up front, Kent, has a timer. And in 30 seconds, he's going to hold up a yellow little sign. When it turns red, I'm going to jump in, and we'll just move on to the next person. And we'll start uh, the first question with Mr. D'Agostino. And then go down, and the next question we'll start with Ms. Younger, and so forth. So we're not going to just start with one person. It'll kind of go through. Then we'll have a number of questions at the end, 90 seconds to answer. And then we have to, we're already gathering some audience questions. And by the way, audience, have our cards. If you'd like to write out a question, it needs to come down Brett, down here in the front. Do you have one? And then we will have closing statements, and that will be 90 seconds also. Sound good? Yep. Sounds good. All present but one. So I think we'll just kick this off. So once again, we'll start with Mr. D'Agostino. Yeah? Do you want to explain how we moved to this? Oh, <laughs> detail. So we do have three districts represented here. As you can see, six, two, and four. And we do have a map up here that shows the different districts and how they were uh, split up, kind of odd boundary lines, but you have to remember doing districts, you have to have equal or more or less equal population in each district. And that becomes problematic with the ruralness of Vista and some of the areas of Carlsbad and Oceanside. So these boundary lines are really odd, but Vista does have at least three of the districts with heavy Vista representation. Fair enough? <coughs> Any questions? Seeing none, we move on. Once again, to start. Brief introduction of yourself. What makes you qualified to be on the board? You are currently on the board to retain your position or share any experience you have had with Tri-City Medical Center, your involvement with either patients, nurses, staff, and the like. Good enough? Good enough. Yes, <clears throat> Please. Okay, I, is this on? Okay, click it on. Click it on. There we go. Well, again, I'm usually loud enough. Put it again, in. I'm Dr. Jim D'Agostino, doctor of physical therapy and a practitioner, yes. Put up your chin. Okay. There you so go. Now, I again, I am Dr. Jim D'Agostino, doctor of physical therapy, uh, current practitioner of physical therapy in, uh, Oce in Oceanside. Uh, I've practiced physical therapy for 45 years. I continue to do that. Don't ask me why, but I do. Uh, I'm also current board chair for Tri-City Medical Center. I've been on the board for five years. Uh, my son was born at Tri-City. Uh, I have been involved with all the physicians at Tri-City. I see their patients. I do work with them. I know most of the orthopedists intimately because, again, bone and joints is what I do. So that has been my connection with the hospital. For all practical purposes, you could call me a competitor of the hospital because I have a competitive physical therapy department. So that's what I do though. I'm a practitioner in the community. I feel like I'm a part of this community in my practice, 
I've been here 45 years living here and uh, with my family who uses Tri-City totally, that's my link to Tri-City Hospital. Good job. <coughs> My name is Tracy Younger, and I'm Carlsbad resident. I've lived in Carlsbad for 14 years, and I have been a healthcare executive in the hospital realm for 22 years. And eight of those years, I actually it's here. Eight of those years, I worked at Tri City. I was the director of outpatient ambulatory care. I opened up new service lines, and I brought millions of dollars to the bottom line while I was there in my tenure. My last hospital role, I was the system director of business development, where I created strategic partnerships in the community. We partnered with Radies to open a NICU. This was a Marietta. I was over two hospital systems there. We partnered with the Marshall Steel System for joints. We recruited doctors. So I have a very vast experience in the hospital realm, and that's what I think qualified. Well, I know what that, it qualifies me to be on the board. Um, and. Good evening, my name is Jim Berlew. Um, my background is healthcare. I've been a vice president of facility operations for Mission Health. They are one of the Truman Analytics uh, six time award winners. Also, uh, regional director of 24 hospitals, 350 clinics for Ascension Health for the state of Michigan. I actually took on 24% of the whole market that Ascension Health had. Um, I've been through 24 Joint Commission surveys, so I know what it takes for CMS and Joint Commission requirements and um, integrated with the Joint Commission and CMS uh, quite intimately. I hold a Master's, an MBA in Healthcare Management, also a Bachelor's in Healthcare Management. I'm a Fellow of the Amer American College of Healthcare Executives. I'm a Certified Healthcare Facility Manager and OSHPOD, California State Certified Hospital Inspector. I hold 64 other credentials and license to include being a certified fire marshal billing official. So I know what it takes to get a facility to go and run. When I was in Michigan, I actually saved 25% off the operating budget within the first year, but I was able to do that by insourcing people, not outsourcing people. Um, I increased the quality of the facilities that they had there, took their worst facility that they had, and within five months, I actually turned it around to be one of the best facilities they had in the state. Um, I'm endorsed by the California Nurses Association, the Service Employee International Union, the Oceanside Firefighters, the Evolve California, our Revolution North County San Diego, and the North County Labor Alliance. So I've spoken with each and every one of them. Uh, most of these people work within the hospital system themselves, and they have vetted me. Thank you. Mr. Chavez. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a Monday. You know, it's, I'm sure you have other things to do. I think there's a football game going on pretty soon. The, uh, my wife and I have been involved with Tri-City Medical for over 20 years, when we first came here, serving in the medical uh, We were involved in the foundation area as far as giving our resources. Uh, Tri-City Medical is extremely important to us because uh, nearly 20 years ago, my son uh, came down first with schizophrenia. And so the mental health facility is a big issue to me. That's why, quite frankly, why I'm running. Because I know the behavioral health center needs to be here. Because every day I wonder if something happened to my son, where would I go? And going down to uh, the Naval Hospital down in San Diego is not something I'd like to go through. As you know, in my health care, I was the Secretary of Veteran Affairs. Many may not know that we actually ran nine different health care facilities. And I think what that brings to me is, I'm a community person and I see it from a higher level. My observation of 20 years, the problem in the rank of Tri-City is you normally have people in the medical profession within it. And it's been a fight between the nurses and the doctors and the unions. And we forget that of the 79 health care districts in the state, it's actually a part of the state system as a place of last resort. So it's extremely important. So I bring that to it. I've also been uh, in the health care committee and assembly, running the budgets and policies I run through since I've been an assembly member for six years. I was awarded the legislator of the year by the Association of California Healthcare Districts. Um, so I know this area, either as a city council member in Oceanside or as the assembly member. To me, this is about community service. I'd be honored to serve as your representative on the board. I'm not a doctor. 
on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell? Hi, my name is Laura Mitchell. I'm a graduate of Palmar College in 1989. We've been in California since 1975. And for me, I've been here since 1975, except for three years in the Army. Um, I was a staff nurse at Tri-City for 12 years. And before that, I worked registry and I was a new grad there. So Tri-City is where I became and learned how to become a nurse. I had my daughter there. Many members of my, well, I have a really small family, but several members of my family were hospitalized there. And for me, Tri-City is just where my heart is. I've worked in other hospitals, and until recently, I've always been a staff nurse. I avoided the management track. Um, and I just, it truly is where my heart is. And as a board member, I feel that I'm, it's, it's kind of awkward sometimes because when I'm a nurse, I have my patients, but when I'm a director, the whole community is my patient. And having to balance everybody's needs and issues is difficult, but I try to do the best that I can. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell, thank you. Mr. Coulter. Hi, my name is, my name is George Coulter, and uh, I, I helped up with the psychiatric unit in 1983. And I worked there until I got on the board in 2008, and I was on the board from 08 to 12. And during the four years I was on the board, it's the best that the hospital had done for many, many years. Uh, while I was on the board there, I was also on the board of Association for California Hospital Districts, which I was also on their education committee. And uh, at Tri-City Hospital, I was on six different committees, including the audit, finance, uh, professional affairs, etc. Uh, I don't know what's been changing there, but the closure of the psychiatric unit, I think, is one of the worst things that hospital has ever done. And one of my main goals is to get that unit back open and take care of the people in the community. I was uh, on the streets of Oceanside last, last week, I believe it was, and these poor people were wandering around aimlessly. They have no place to go, they're getting no help. Uh, we need to make some changes to keep that open. They also have plans on closing labor and delivery. I'm thinking, is there no more mentally ill? Is there no more people having babies? What's going on? If you start closing down things because they're not making enough money, you're gonna end up closing the hospital. And uh, that's my main reason to get back on the board is to get that turned around and uh, help the hospital start making money again and be there for everybody in the community. And I said, I'm a man of many thoughts, but few words. Thank you. Mr. Coulter, thank you. Well, that was an easy first round. Uh, we are gonna start the, the second question with Ms. Younger, and that is, there's been a great deal of discussion recently about the recent suspicion, suspension of the Behavioral Health Unit. Some of you were on the board that made that decision, while others have been critical of the decision. What is your position on the suspension of the behavioral health unit, and why is that your position? I'm definitely for keeping the behavioral health unit open. Uh, my feeling is, I, the hospital that I came from in Marietta, we, one of our sister hospitals in Corona, had a very successful inpatient behavioral health program. So I feel like if maybe that all the resources weren't tapped out or tapped into, that could have prevented that closure. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely for opening it and I hope that we can rally around maybe possibly a reopen, reopening it. Thank you very much, Ms. Younger. Would you like the question repeated, Mr. Berlou? No, I'm good. And by the way, these are 90 second, 90 second question or answers. Okay. Thank you, you're on. So on August 21st, we heard the reasons why they needed to close the behavioral health unit. Uh, one of the reasons they stated was the existing condition for the anti-ligature. And I've done five of these different anti-ligature programs. And uh, the chairman mentioned that the whole hospital would be shut down if Joint Commission came in and found these things. That is not the case. It is the furthest thing from the truth. So listening to what was going on, I knew that I had to step in. Um, also with Oshpod, we have many things that are existing non-conforming that you do not have to upgrade, otherwise you would never catch up to the code. 
And then we heard in, in August 21st that they needed to turn a profit of $10 million bottom line. Well, we heard in September from the CFO that they actually turned a profit of $11.2 million. And they knew about this in June. So they had enough money to keep it open. They made this profit while the BHU was still open in the CSU. So they had the finances to keep it going, keep it open. So I'm definitely for opening it. It is a service line, like many, that may not make money, but it's something the community desperately needs. And that's why I advocated for it and spoke against the closure of it at every board meeting since then. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grolu. Mr. Chavez, would you like it repeated? No, I understand it. Thank you. This is probably uh, a really good example of showing the difference of who all of us, who we are. The, there was a problem in Tri-City Medical to take care of behavioral health issues. One of the facility literature you just talked about, what hasn't been talked about is the ability to get doctors up here, uh, 724 to meet the needs. There's been a shortage of doctors. And the other issue is cost is a real thing. You know, we can talk, it's easy to say I would do something, but the reality when you're sitting on the board, you gotta, you gotta solve the problem. What I think that needs has to happen is you need a sustainable regional solution. There's a role for Tri-City, there's a role for the county, there's a role for the state, there's a role for the feds. And what I bring to the table is I can interact with all those different levels very easily because I've been doing it now for over almost two decades. You need to have a leader to come in and say, okay, we have a problem. How can we bring everybody to, to take care of it and get a sustainable regional solution? It's easy to poke at other people who don't have to take a vote. It's tough when you're in there, and I understand that I've been on that table before. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell? Um, the service is suspended, and I know we're talking weasel words, suspended versus closed, but the licenses are still there, and we hope to reopen it at some point. But there are structural changes that need to be done. We recently completed our joint commission visit, and we were told it they changed their grading system, low, moderate, low, moderate, and high risk, and immediate threat to life. And then extent was limited to widespread. And the behavioral health unit inpatient came out as high and widespread. And they said, quite frankly, that if we hadn't had this plan, it would have been immediate threat to life. And that closes down hospitals because you can't admit you don't get your <coughs> until you can fix the problem. It was a difficult decision. I don't know any other you know we looked at all the combinations and permutations but i agree with mr chavez this is a community situation problem that requires a community solution and we all have to pull together and we just can't rely on one or two places thank you mr coulter would you like to question repeat sure There's been a great deal of discussion recently about the recent suspension of the behavioral health unit. Some of you were on the board that made that decision. Others have been critical of the decision. What is your position and why? Well, my position is it should never even be on suspension. Uh, I've been talking with NAMI several times, the National Association for the Mental Health, and they're quite upset that, that uh, we're considering closing. And, uh, I think we need to do anything and everything it's going to take to keep it open because it is one of the mainstays for the mentally ill in North County. They have to have some place to go. We can't send them all down to San Diego. What happens when the police officers pick them up? Now they got to take their time to go all the way down to San Diego with the patient, do all the paperwork and check again, where before they just had to drive to Tri-City, do some quick paperwork, and we're going to take care of them from there. I was... Um, a psychiatric liaison for the behavioral, I mean, for behavioral health and the emergency department. So I would go in there to evaluate these patients and we would do our best to get them placed properly. And uh, we, need, we need the unit. We have to have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. And to finish off, Mr. D'Agostino. So, I'm the chairman of the board that got to make the decision. So, let's talk about hope and promise versus reality. Last week, Jaco came to our clinic and they cited us for the behavioral health unit. You heard Director Mitchell tell us that. What a citation means of that level is, 
You either close the institution or you have a fix-it plan. And Jaco said to us last week, because you have a fix-it plan, we are not going to close your unit. It's kind of what we anticipated. It's why we took this radical decision. I think it was uh, Mr. Chavez that talked about the inability to get behavioral health people consistently here. That is how you treat mentally health, mental health patients appropriately. You need the psychiatrist on staff to be able to get their medications regulated. And the third thing you need to do is you do need to make some sort of a profit or at least somewhere near the bottom line because ladies and gentlemen, that's what the future is over there. If you don't build that building by 2030, Tri-City is going to be knocked down. That's because we don't meet seismic standards. So when you make a decision, you've got to step back and look at short term, long term. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bergostino. Okay, so question three, and we will start with you, Mr. Babu. Much has been discussed, great segue, much has been discussed about Tri-City's need to come into compliance with earthquake readiness. Some people have suggested pursuing another bond to meet the Medical Center's 2030 seismic rebuilding deadline. What is your position on achieving compliance, and what is your plan to fund the necessary rebuild together? Well, initially, the, uh, the building itself, it is not compliant, we know that. And by 2030, which is in about 12 years, is when that time comes up. Uh, the plan they have right now is going to be a future disaster. Um, they want to actually increase the footprint of the building by 25% with about 375 beds. Currently, they only have about 158 people that are in the beds every single day. So the building is way overbuilt. So I've done five of these projects. And what we normally do is we go through to make it sustainable, and we right size it. And we make the building with the workflow management for the entire building efficient. That means it usually ends up being smaller with provisions to actually expand down the road if need be. So right now, the workflow management needs to be put into place, not put a new tower in front of an existing structure. The new tower would end up actually costing two and a half million dollars just to keep the lights on and the heat going. So since you don't have the money to do that right now because of the behavioral health, you're gonna end up closing down more service lines because you don't have the processes and procedures in place. So if we're able to get the processes and procedures in place, make the thing more efficient, then we'll be able to save the money, like we've done everywhere else at all kinds of other hospitals. You don't have to build a big mammoth that's up on the hill. And that's what I would do is get the process procedures done first, so that way we can show we are efficient and we can actually be building something sustainable before we go to the public for a bond. Mr. Chavez, good with the question? I'm good with it. You know, living in California, earthquake readiness is a, is a real issue that needs to be addressed. And having come from the state legislature, I can tell you that we arbitrarily pick dates all the time. Mm -hmm. We have one right now, 2045, that we're all going to be 100% great. <coughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So we need to, I think the best thing we can do for Tri-City right now is rebuild our relationship with the community. That's why I'm running. I think the board members need to start working with the other hospitals in the area, meet more uh, in a more uh, active manner with city council members, with assembly members, with senators. You need to be more out there letting people know all the great things you're doing. And then when people feel good about you, then you can go ahead and ask for the support. So I would not say any bond now or even bond now for the near future, but to do what we do well and build our image back up and understand if we have to stop it, the deadline extended. You can do that through state action. As I said earlier, there's 79 healthcare districts in the state. We're not the only ones following in this situation. And, we, and the state legislator and the governor knows that it's critical to have Tri-City here for the healthcare of the community. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell, are you good with the question? Yes. Um, Perhaps it slipped Mr. Bermuda's mind that the two buildings that do not meet this requirement have 160 adult beds and 28 NICU beds. They can be used for outpatient, they can be used for offices, but they cannot be used for inpatient. So the patient care tower and the plans have been around since 2012. Our ED, ICU, telemetry, there's talk about moving OB over there, it goes back and forth. I think it depends on the number of floors. 
um, that we'll have, but we won't be able to have patients in those units. And if we can't do that, then we we can't expand our other services if we can't put them in a safe area. And bonds have not been a success with the Tri-City Healthcare District, so that's not something I would recommend. Mr. Coulter. Can I respond to her? No, no, no. Okay. Please. Do you need help with the question? No, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we're ready to go for a bond yet or not, but uh, we're going to need something pretty soon because we do need to get the hospital retrofitted. Uh, we had plans in 08 to 12. We had a building already planned out. I don't know what happened to those ideas. Uh, I agree with Rocky Chavez that we need to get the community involved again. Uh, when I was on the board, we got gold and platinum status for heart attacks, for strokes, and things of that nature. We gotta make sure that that's still happening. We were in, listed in the top 100 hospitals in the country when I was on the board. We need to make sure that that's still happening. If it's not, we need to get back on board. And uh, we do need to be what we were in 08 to 12. Mr. Coulter, thank you. By the way, Mr. Berlou, if you'd like to use time in the follow following questions or in your closing statements, by all means, you can you can have uh, comments to other answers on, thank you. on that question. Mr. D'Agostino. Yes, yeah, just, just repeat that for Of course. Me. Would you, sir? Thank Much you. has been discussed about Tri-City's need to come into compliance with earthquake readiness. Some people have suggested pursuing another bond to meet that uh, deadline. What is your position and how would you achieve it and fund it? Well, at this point in time, I think the existing board has a plan to fund it. As I agree with my colleague, Director Mitchell, no way is this community going to go for a bond. We attempted it three times, three times it was voted down. And honestly, it was because of the credibility of the board. We still have some building of trust to do with you before I would go to the citizens for a bond. However, what we do have in plan is we have a financial partner in HUD, and HUD has agreed to fund us if we can afford to pay that debt. They have refinanced our debt, so $51 million is released, and by 2020, I've got to take that team back, as I took it back in 14, to meet with Mr. Papsko from HUD and qualify for the remainder of the $100 million plus to build this hospital. I think that is the most viable solution to get this hospital retrofitted. And I do agree with my colleagues that the beds that we've planned may not be all of what we put in. It's outpatient services and clinics and public health clinics that we probably need to concentrate on. Ms. Young, are you good with the question? Yes. Uh, well, I was around in Tri-City when they started talks about building that new building. And I have to tell you, um, when I went to the next hospital system, it was nothing like what we had done there. We partnered with a really great company called Freeman White, and I have to hand it to Jim. He said it exactly. You have to work on workflow. There's so much more. This is such a bigger project than just putting up a pretty new building for a legacy. There's so much more that goes into it. You have to work with each department and build teams and really do this strategically. So I agree with Jim 100% with you said. Very good. We're on to question four. Mr. Chavez, you will start this one off. <clears throat> there are many rating criteria for hospitals. In some, Tri-City ranks high, and in some, Tri-City does not. How do you measure Tri-City's service to the community? What metrics are most important to you for a successful <coughs> district Hospital. You know, you go to the website for the uh, Association of California Healthcare Districts, and they talk about these are the different metrics that communities need to evaluate. And they go talking about, you know, strokes, heart attack, obesity, mental health. Uh, they list all the things that we're dealing with every day in our community. What needs to be done, what I would do coming into Tri City is that. As I referred to earlier, regional solutions. We live in probably the best place to live in California for healthcare. 
If you need to see uh, uh, the search, the things we're doing right now with DNA research, the things we're doing right now for longevity and life, I mean, if you're out in Fresno or Bakersfield, your ability to get to the doctor you need or Missouri is nothing like you can get here in San Diego. The longevity of life in San Diego is higher than any other place. So if you have any of those medical health issues or Alzheimer's or anything else, this is the place to be. So what I would say the criteria Tri-City needs to do is look at scripts, look at Sharp, look at what's going down and say, where can we show our, our strength and where can you show your strength? One of the problems North County has been, we're always trying to eat everybody's bowl of rice and so they're trying to work together and get a regional solution. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell, do you need help with the question? No. Um, we have the affiliation with UCSD, and it's, we're about halfway through five years. It's been a learning process for everyone, but we're able to bring that world-class care to the community. But as a nurse, I know I've heard of metrics. I can look at numbers, but as a nurse, for me, the best thing is it's the best outcome for the patient and the patient's family that we can possibly do. And sometimes that's going home and sometimes it's not going home. And those are hard ones. Um, community involvement, we need to strengthen the continuum of care. It used, when I started, you went from the hospital to home in better shape than you came in. But now it's hospital to skilled nursing to home health. So we need to strengthen that con the, continu the continuum of care so that we're closing up the holes in that particular safety net. Thank you. Mr. Coulter, you done with the question? I uh, got it, sir. Um, patient care statistics and uh, stat satisfaction are always the two top on my list on what we need. Oh, I'm sorry. I know. And uh, when we first got on the board in uh, 2008, things weren't as they seemed. Uh, I was still working in psychiatry and I had people calling me and asking me to meet them in the dining room to talk about the problems that were happening. And that's what helped get me deciding to get on the board in the first place. Uh, if you're making widgets, you want the people to make the best widgets they can. Our nurses, are taking care of patients and we want the nurses to be the best that they can and have everything that they need to do quality care so we can do the best uh, patient care that we can. Uh, I've always been after that. I've never been one for, oh, you're a, you're a member of the board of directors, et cetera. No, I'm just George and I'm here to make sure that everybody's being taken care of. Take good care of the nurses, they take good care of the patients and the patients will help prop up the hospital. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Mr. D'Agostino, would you like me to repeat the question? Could you please? Of course. Right. I don't want to be distracted and go off on my own tangent. No, 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 no. Oh, heavens, <laughs> no. There are you many, don't want to hear that. <laughs> there are many, many rating criteria for hospitals, and some Tri-City ranks high, and some Tri-City does not. How do you measure Tri-City service to the community, and what metrics are important to you um, for a successful district hospital? I hate to say this, I am not a metrics person, and I know we have a lot of pluses. We are a gold plus heart and stroke program, and that is deserved. And why that is important to me is because it meets the criteria that's important to me. When you come to hospital, you want to hook up with a world-class doctor. You want to be diagnosed, you want it done quickly, you want the treatment to be appropriate, and you want to go home. And that's the criteria that I match. You don't need to be readmitted because the blood work was wrong. You don't need to be readmitted because you missed the diagnosis. The key is diagnose, treat, and go home. Because actually, a hospital is a den of disease. And you don't want people hanging around there because it's a really bad place and a lot of bugs are there. So that's my criteria. We have put together UCSD, I'm gonna call it the doctor factory, which can produce new doctors to replace our gray hair doctors. Here's one of them right here. So the second thing you need to do is you need to build that concrete structure so the doctors have an office to practice in. And the third thing you need to do is you need to have consistent, good equipment that will allow them to do their diagnosis. And that's really all you need to do with a healthcare institution. And if we can do that and we can prove that to the community, maybe we can talk to you about doing some bonds later on. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D'Agostino. Ms. Younger. Turn it off, sir. I want to shut you up. I don't want to. <laughs> if you don't mind, do you mind? Please, repeating it. I would be glad to. Uh, there are many rating criteria for hospitals, and some Tri-City ranks high, and some Tri-City does not. How do you measure Tri-City's service to the community? Question one. Question two, what metrics are important to you for a successful district hospital? Well, unfortunately, we all look at fraud and all the statistics and those types of scores, but really, I think what's important to me from working in hospitals over 22 years is, is employee satisfaction. You know, there's a study that was done. They trained doctors and staff to smile at everyone in the hallway, and patients' perception of care skyrocketed. So it's thing, little things like that. If you have happy employees and happy physicians, you're going to have good quality of care. And like Dr. D'Agostino said, you have to have good working equipment. So those are the things that matter to me. It's patient care, obviously, is first and foremost, but how you get that is satisfied, happy employees and physicians. Mr. Bidlou, you good with the question? I'm good. You're on. So the, the patient surveys, which are LeapFrog Group, um, CMS, HCAPS, you know, Tri-City actually has an A rating about three years ago, but now they're down to a C. And when you look at those metrics, Tri-City has one of the lowest metrics in the whole United States. They set the bar to the very bottom. They have lowest CMS scores for patient ratings and quality and safety in the county. And on top of that, US News and World Report rates the medical services for some of the doctors to be average to low average. When you look at the competitors in the county, Palomar, uh, Scripps, and so on, they're actually average to above average. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done with the doc side of the house as well. We used to be in the top 100, then we were in the top 150. Now we're not even on the chart. So the culture in the organization needs to change because right now, you know, the employees, they don't feel it, regardless of what anyone says. The daily census at the hospital it used to be 70,000 patients in the ED at one time. Now they're down to 60,000. 75% of those patients go into the hospital. We've gone from 200 patients a day to 158 a day. Scripps and Palomar, they've all increased. Palomar's gone from 98 to 148,000. Scripps, they've gone from 40,000 in NCDS to 48,000. So there's a lot of quality that needs to be instilled in this organization, and I can do that. Mr. Berlue, thank you. Uh, yes, you will begin for us, Ms. Mitchell. Fifth question. A medical center is only as good as the staff and doctors that work there. What is your plan for attracting, motivating, and retaining key personnel, such as doctors, administrators, and department directors? Well, there's always plans to do that. Um, the question is, can we put them in action and bring them to fruition? We don't really, like many places, we don't really have the problem getting people to come. It's getting them to stay. So making sure that the work environment for the employees is the best we can possibly make it. Making sure that the doctors, the physicians can treat their patients um, in an atmosphere, in, a, in an environment where they get, you know, the patient gets everything they need, the physician gets everything they need to treat the patient, um, are probably the two top things. The other thing we need to be mindful of is this isn't, when ma I was a new grad when managed care started in 1988. And so I was trained in one model, but I had to practice in another model. So things are moving to the outpatient sector and we have to adapt with that change. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Mr. Coulter, are you good with the question? I'm good. Um, I totally agree we need retention. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, when I've been at the hospital, we still have excellent doctors, we still have excellent nurses, and what we need to focus on is to keep them and to make sure we have excellent managers, no brow beaters or anybody like that, and uh, excellent administrators. 
Because if you've got a good administrator, then you've got good management, you're going to have nurses that are going to continue to be excellent. And that would be my goal is to continue that. And uh, like I said, uh, I've worked with a lot of the doctors in the emergency department, and I wouldn't trade them for any doctor in the world. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Dr. Vagastino. Thank you, sir. Um, this is not the time for what I call showboat platitudes. You're a board member, you're supposed to come up with a plan with your CEO. We have proposed that plan. UCSD, as I said, is our doctor factory. Those are your docs you have to bring in to replace our older doctors. They're younger, they need to come in. The second thing we've done is we found out that Tri-City can employ doctors and own doctors in a public health clinic environment. And that's how we can compete where other communities try to attract their doctors in like La Jolla, we can bring them in a public health clinic. Because doctors have to be guaranteed that they can make it in the community that they practice in. And the ability to support a doctor in a public clinic that Tri-City owns, and they partially own, can guarantee that they stay in this community. And the third thing is, is we need to bring in key docs to fill in what we call the gray hairs and support them through compensation over a period of time. You're going to be 100,000 doctors short in the United States. We are going to compete with every community, San Francisco, New York, and all of that. We need to make sure that our community is attractive. We've got the good weather. We've got the good, nice place to live. We just have to make sure economically these docs can survive here. Dr. D'Agostino, thank you. Ms. Younger, good with the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so I was in Marietta, and recruitment was my specialty. I recruited 25 doctors in one year, and if I can recruit 25 new amazing doctors who are committed to the area in Marietta, this should be a piece of cake slam dunk for Tri-City. We live right by the ocean. We're in a thriving community. There's, there's no reason we shouldn't attract quality, good, good doctors. But we also need to look at our travelers. We need to reduce the amount of travelers we have at Tri-City and really build up our community again with recruit people from our community. Um, so I think partnering, like Dr. Diagostino said and Laura said, with UCSD would definitely bring a tremendous amount of good physicians to the area. And key contracts, it's really how you build the contract is how you keep these physicians in the area. Thank you, Ms. Younger. Mr. Berlou. I'm good. I'm a little confused because Laura said that trying to keep the doctors there is the toughest thing to do. And then Dr. D'Agostino here says that there's a doctor mill down at UCSD, but he mentioned one of the closures for the behavioral health was because there wasn't enough doctors from UCSD. So there's a little mixed messages here. But one thing is correct. We do need to collaborate with other healthcare systems in the county. I have a couple meetings with some of the top leaders at those healthcare facilities. Uh, coming up in the upcoming weeks to try to brainstorm a little bit on exactly that. Um, I came from an organization, like I mentioned, that is a true banana leaf winner, six times. Scripps is five times, just to put in perspective. One thing we did there to make it a great place to work and practice was we utilized a system from Marcus Buckingham called Stand Up. And this system actually increased our employee engagement by 80%. So I would bring a tool like that into Tri-City. And when employees are engaged, they're a lot happier, obviously. Opening the behavioral health unit is obviously gonna make the emergency department flow quicker, not clog it up like it's about to do. So the physicians won't be as frustrated because the emergency department has got a slow throughput, which will make them wanna stay there, hopefully. So those would be some of the immediate steps that I would utilize to try to take care of the problems. Thank you, Mr. Berlou. Mr. Chavez, good with the question? I'm good. We're running for Tri-City Medical Board here. That's a leadership role. A leadership in setting the tone and atmosphere at Tri-City Medical. Sitting up here, denigrating <clears throat> the process, or denigrating people, or denigrating the operation, doesn't build a wealth of confidence in the community. I've been watching this happen for 20 years. We need to get community leaders up here who can do that. Now, my son's a doctor, and I've always wanted this. I've asked him, I said, why, why do people can become doctors or nurses that want to work in hospitals? What's their number one reason? They want to help people. 
they really care. You know, nurses, you know, they're one of the ones that have the largest rate of back injuries. Mm -hmm. So these people want to help people. If we could just give them the right pay and no need to be here so they can live in the beautiful area. And I got news for you. Attracting people to San Diego is a lot better attracting people to Bakersfield. And so uh, we should be able to get them in here. But the big issue is the board cannot be dysfunctional. We don't need people who are running for this board who are going to go down and start telling people how to run things at the grassroots level. We need leaders who have standards and hold them to that. Mr. Chavez, thank you. And that concludes the prepared questions on our part. And Mr. Coulter, you have the pleasure of, here's the first audience question. Okay. And these are the, <clears throat> forgive me, 60 seconds. Mr. Coulter, what have you done to better Tri-City Medical Center? Well, I got... Uh, never mind. <laughs> I, have, I have received a lot of microwaves while at Tri-City Hospital for patient care, and uh, I was on the uh, M&M Committee uh, for Behavioral Health, that's a um, new you, and... Um, oh, dear. I just walked the other word about it, sorry. But anyway, I always put my input into taking care of the milieu where we worked and the people that we worked with. And uh, I will continue to do so. Uh, when I was on the board, I got lots of accolades also for the work that I had done. And I was actually asked to come back and be on the board. I didn't just jump up and say, I want to be on the board again. They said, George, we need you again, and so here I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Dr. D'Agostino, what have you done to better Tri-City Medical Center? Not enough. <laughs> I will tell you, when I first got on this board five years ago, I thought this job would be easier, but it's not. And what I realized was is that the board had to clean up its act. We had to be an efficient governance system, not a busybody interfering with administration trying to run the hospital. I'm a philosophical and community leader that directs how the CEO runs the hospital. Remember, the CEO is hired by the board to run the hospital. And if we don't like the hospital, we get rid of the CEO. So that's the first thing I had to learn. What I do need to do right now, if I can come back and be elected, is I've got to secure that building, got to get HUD to keep our financing up, because I do not believe this community will support us until we get a better reputation. Dr. D'Agostino, thank you. Ms. Younger, what have you done to better Tri-City Medical Center? Well, when I was at Tri-City, I opened up eight different service lines, and I'm probably most proud of the wound care center. And I, my goal when I was there, I said I want this wound care center to be the regional leader. And I know from my friends who still are at the wound care center that they are indeed the regional leader. So that's really... and. Beyond that, just I'm always a huge supporter of the hospital and I'm a big advocate and I really am passionate about wanting to see this hospital thrive. Thank you very much. Mr. Bergalou, what have you done? Uh, just for a note of clarification, in the last board meeting we had, Jim D'Agostino asked about the USP 800 pharmacy upgrades. I know Rocky wants to lean on the leadership and not get down in there, but the COO mentioned that the pharmacy upgrades were done in April. They hadn't actually even begun. They haven't even begun today. So you can't really just trust. You need to trust but verify. I've actually raised, when I was at Tri-City, the student group level um, from the bottom 7th percentile to the 28th percentile in nine months. Christmas time of that year, I was in the bottom of a pit in the kitchen, digging out sewer, trying to help it while people were in the hospital. And I'm a lifetime ambassador to the hospital. I've donated quite a bit of money to it. I'm on the donor wall. So I've done quite a bit, but I can't do enough. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you, Mr. Berlou. Mr. Chavez. Well, I can tell you, I have not sued Tri-City Hospital. On my <laughs> side. The, uh, but I will say that my wife and I have been involved, like I said, over 20 years to the foundation, going to their events and supporting them for all the different areas. As the assembly member, when the HUD, we were trying to get the money for HUD, I was the one that sat down with them in the back room telling them why this Tri-City was so important 
to this region and why they support it. And uh, the report back I got was, I was one of the critical reasons why they went forward with that. Additionally, serving two terms in Oceanside, I always sing the praise of Tri-City because I knew Tri-City not only was critical for community health, was also an economic engine second to only Camp Pendleton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell, what have you done? Well, as a staff nurse for 11 years and a department educator for one year, as well as being a representative for the California Nurses Association, I advocated for my patients and I advocated for my coworkers. As a board member, I just get the work done. I, I believe I've never missed a board meeting. I've never missed a committee meeting. I just come in and I do what needs to be done. And that's the way I practice nursing and that's the way I'm on the board. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Okay, second audience question and we will start with you. We start with you, we start right, with Mr. You. Coulter? Yeah. yeah. Back to Dr. D'Agostino. Okay, so the question is, are you familiar with the Hill Burton Law? How does it relate to Tri-City Hospital? Well, I'm not solely familiar with it. I remember back in the old days when Hilbert and Grants came around in the 1950s. And they were brought into play when California wanted to block grants some money for mental health. And they kind of did that through trying to provide mental health services, you know, inpatient to communities, to homes, kind of like family members taking care of family members. That's the original Hill Burton I remember. The old Hill Burton grants were the ones from the federal government, which used to replace what was called the fee for service or the free service. And that's the extent of what I know about Hill Burton grants. I don't think they much apply today to hospitals. I think they're more related to county and county funding. Thank you very much, and Ms. Younger? I'll be honest with you, I don't, I'm not familiar with that, but I will look it up and research it. Fair enough. Mr. Berlou, you're up. Yeah, I'm not familiar with Hill Burton. I'm more familiar with the current laws that we have, like the Short Doyle Act and the Prop 63 MHSA program that was put into place back in 2004. Um, and I've spoken with some of the county leadership down here to find out how we can actually get more money from it. And what they've said is, Tri-City just needs to come to us and we will give them more money, but they just need to come to us. I do understand it's a county issue and some of the other healthcare organizations will step up and say the same thing, which is okay, but the county says they have a lot of money, a lot of surplus, and they are willing to give it to help out with the mental health services. Thank you, Mr. Berlou. Mr. Chavez. Well, in the uh, two decades of politics I've been in, I've learned this. Never be a something you don't know, and I'll have to look that one up. Fair enough. Thank you. Ms. Mitchell. If I remember correctly, the Hill Burton Hospital Act was enacted in the years after World War II and provided federal funding for the building of hospitals throughout the United States, such as Tri-City. Uh, most of them were public hospitals, I believe. Um, I don't think they were like any privates but it helped expand the community hospital network and provided desperately needing funding, needed funding for construction. But I, that was, that's the big thing that I know about Hill Burton. I may have other components to it, but the hospital building is what I remember the most. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Mr. Coulter. Uh, I also have to uh, refresh my memory on that. But I, I do believe that that's how Tri-City got started with their small hospital in downtown Oceanside uh, right after World War II. And uh, we kept building from there. And whether we can get more money from them or what's happening with that, I have not had a clue since I've been off the board. Fair enough, Mr. Coulter. And the final audience question, at least that I have, and we will start with you, Ms. Younger is please share with us your knowledge and opinion of the medical office building on the campus at Tri-City that has been the subject of litigation. Has the builder been paid? Has the value of the building been added to the books? Liabilities on it? So forth. Please, comments. Um, from what I understand, they're spending about $5 million a year in litigation. So, and it's been not empty for five years. So, what 
I think it's imperative that they settle their lawsuits and get the building open that could bring a tremendous amount of revenue source to Tri City. Thank you, Ms. Young. Mr. Perlou. That's a big one there. All right, so uh, what I've learned looking at the financials that Tri City has submitted to Oshpot today is 2017, they actually took a, a line item and added it to the assets of $25 million, whereas every other year it's been about $2 million. So they actually added their asset of that medical office building to the Tri-City financials reported to the state. Um, they're in arbitration right now, trying to appeal it the third time, it's been denied, and they're trying to force the guy that built it to take it back, so that way they still have control to tell him who can be inside the building, which means they will not let him have anybody in the building. So that building will essentially end up trying to be forced to be sold pennies on the dollar from what it is now. But They've already paid quite a bit of money. They owe another $20 million at least. And um, it just needs to be open because they've been losing $5 million minimum a year on not opening that thing, not to mention the legal costs. Thank you, Mr. Berlou. Mr. Chavez. This is probably a very good question to highlight. Uh, who do you want to put on the board? The ranker in the Tri-City Medical when the decision to go forward with this building and then the CEO there uh, was, was the problem. Deals were made behind the room, buddies were paid off, a number of lawsuits went through, and at the end of the day, the only people who lost were the citizens of the Tri-City area. It's easy to uh, throw rocks at a messed up situation. It's harder to figure out what are you gonna do next? And I think that's what I bring coming to the uh, Tri-City board is an understanding of organization and leadership and how we can get going in the right direction. I'm not interested in digging up graves of uh, mistakes of Tri City in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell. The one thing that gives me agita every day. Um, I stepped into this in 2014 and I'm still not quite clear on what exactly happened. Um, I believe I've heard what Mr. Chavez said about deals and, and things. I think there was a lot of poor communication. I would love nothing more than to be able to get physicians offices or put an urgent care on the first floor. Um, perhaps even actually put the behavioral health unit over there, although that would require logistics like the kitchen and housekeeping. But it just needs to be brought online. And like I said, I stepped into this in 2014, and all I see is this building that's empty and useless. Sorry, that's the best I got. Mr. Coulter. Uh, the, the MOB is an absolutely beautiful building. Uh, the contractor beginnings of all that was done well. Uh, there's certain people that were fighting it from day one, they didn't like it. Uh, we could have got the building for another 13 million, but instead they wanted to fight it and get it for pennies on the dollar, like I said. And uh, the court says, no, you'll pay $20 million. So it went from 13 million to 20 million, and now it's even tougher because the hospital is spending so much money in litigation that we could have had that building paid off we could have had people in there in fact the whole bottom floor was already uh leased out and uh nothing was ever done about it so we do need good leadership on the board to make sure that that goes in the right direction thank you thank you mr coulter dr d'agostino okay let's start talking some facts here okay uh the building was put up way back in 11 or 12 or something uh, the building was built for nine to eleven million dollars a judgment in court was given, and a Judge Moss said that building is worth $22 million. I, as a board member, said, I'm not paying $22 million for a $9 million building, especially when it does not have a certificate of occupancy. Do you know that? You can't occupy that building now, because the city hasn't certified it yet. The builder never put up any two-by-fours in the inside. So the bottom line is, is June of 2018, the appeal comes to fruition. And let's see how it goes at that point. Because I agree with you, if you bought that building for 22 million right now, the cost would be $5 a square foot triple net. And no physician is gonna rent that for $5 a triple net. I wouldn't, I can't afford to practice in that building. 
I I'm assuming you meant June of 2019. 2019. Thank, thank you, sir. <laughs> Just uh, for clarity's sake. Okay, so we're we're now at the end of the audience questions. Since you've been so efficient with time, we're going to give you two minutes in closing. And Mr. Berlou, you're going to start us off. You can address previous questions. It's free reign. Two minutes. Uh, just to talk quickly about the SB 1953 Senate Bill for uh, seismic, you know, the hospital needs to be compliant by 2030. There needs to be a full master facility plan performed to make sure that the building is made to be the right size as well as the full campus. You don't just go and do a plan of saying, I'm going to put up a tower right here that has these patient beds that are in there. You know, I've done five of these. I don't think anybody else up here has done one of these replacement facilities. So um, this is just how you do it. So Tracy has, I apologize Tracy. So we really need to slow down the train and we need to do it the right way and pull in the community, pull in the stakeholders, shareholders and do it the right way. Not just slam this thing over here into the side of the building and all of a sudden forcing the community to be responsible for suddenly passing a bond because we have to upgrade the rest of the hospital that they did not upgrade. That's what's going to happen. We're going to be forced to have to pay $600,000 for the existing facility that's not going to be touched to bring that thing up to speed. That's one big elephant that nobody's actually understood or, or mentioned. So we need to do this the right way and bring in the three cities, bring in the county, bring in everybody in so that way we can do the right thing for the community, not just build an icon up on the tower. And that's what's really going to take place. So it needs to be slowed down. We need to do it the right way to save money and to save our community. Um, the behavioral health unit needs to be opened. Um, there's plenty of money there. Instead of spending the $14 million that they have or $12 million they have to build that parking structure, we could utilize a fraction of that to fix the behavioral health unit. And when I spoke to some of the other people that actually said you had to do all these things to it, I said, here's what the CMS requirements were. They said, well, we just didn't know that. So there's a lot of things that they don't know that I do have experience in, and I would show the leadership what they have to do. So if they don't know any better, they don't know what they're doing wrong. And I would actually help them with what I know, but I would listen to other people. Thank you very much, Mr. Berlou. Mr. Chavez, two minutes. You know, uh, Tri-City um, Healthcare was established in 1957. It was built in uh, 1961. And since that time, healthcare has changed dramatically. Also, the area here, which was then rather rural, has changed dramatically, the population. And so, uh, the whole area of healthcare and how you provide it, the surgical centers and people living longer and Alzheimer's and cancer, everything has been changing dramatically. You need to have a leader who comes up to this and under sees a long rule on this. How can we actually solve things in a, in a, a far way? The Behavioral Health Center. It's simple. It's a sustainable regional solution. It's not, Tri City has a role in it, but they're not the solution. They're a leadership in the solution, a component of the solution. And if we're worried about the state and the, what they put on uh, bills or requirements, having been up there for six years, I can tell you, we change those goals all the time. We just run it right through on a consent, and it goes through, and no one even knows it going by. But the bottom line is this. Why is Price City in such a tough position? It's because people who run for this are backed by special interests. They're backed because they sued the hospital and they're upset with them and they want to get back and tell them how to do it. They're going to be prescriptive. They're not going to understand that their role is not to run the hospital every day, but to be the leader of the hospital out of the community. Having run organizations of 22,000 people, I can tell you, you don't need the board of the people at the top going down and telling the janitor how to do their job. You need to have a leader at the top that's talking to their peers and set the right environment for Tri City Medical. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Ms. Mitchell, two minutes. Myself, and Dr. D'Agostino are probably the two practitioners who have been practicing since before the days of managed care. I was a licensed vocational nurse prior to being a registered nurse. And the changes 
have been, there's been the changes on how, the way we deliver the care, but there's been the changes in the care itself. It used to be if you had your appendix out, you're in the hospital for like a week to 10 days. Now you're home in three to four. We're using, we started laparoscopic and then we went to robotic surgery, minimally invasive, low blood loss, reducing the need for pain medicine. So it is feasible and they are starting to trial it to do same day surgery for knee replacements. Not something I'd like to do, but if you're a football player, you messed up your knee and that's your only problem, you can probably do it. So it's a rapidly evolving world in healthcare. And I'm not gonna say I'm just a nurse, because they're gonna put on my tombstone, she was a nurse. But this is how I view the world. I'm a nurse, how can I make the world better? It's very common to want to compare yourself or others to you. And I know we're always talking about Tri-City and Palomar, but the thing is, is Palomar is over four times as large as Tri-City and has about twice as many people. And they've got a district of 800 square miles and we're barely 150. So we need to look at how they manage their large area and see if we can put those practices into our small area. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Mr. Coulter, two minutes. Uh, thank you. Um, I remember the other M on M&M &M House, morale and milieu. And uh, what we need to do is get that started again because in morale and milieu, I was picked to work with administrators on how we can improve our working teams that are working with the patients. And uh, I'd love to see that again. As far as the MOB goes, we need to get that taken care of. We're bleeding money tremendously. Uh, we need to get some people in there and get that building going and start making some more money for the hospital. Uh, I've always had a good head on my shoulders. I'm really, really good at emergencies, so whatever comes up, I'll be very glad to try to help do something about that. And uh, like I said, I was asked to come back to the board and I want to be there to help them in any way that I can. And I will with the support of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coulter. Dr. D'Agostino, two minutes. Thank you. Um, Tri-City today is considered by all of the institutions in San Diego as a linchpin hospital. A linchpin hospital means if we go down, the whole county suffers. And think about it. We are in the northwest corner of San Diego County. <coughs> Your sister hospital, Fallbrook, has closed. San Clemente General Hospital has closed. You get what's going on in the community, people? Things are maybe not as easy in the healthcare business. So if you need, what, what happened back in 57, as Mr. Chavez said, was that we created a hospital to take care of ourselves. We didn't want to go down to Mercy Hospital for health care. We didn't want to go to Hope for health care. We wanted first class community health care in our own community. That's what I would like to guarantee now. That's the start of thing, that concrete structure. By the way, it isn't just the tower, Mr. Perlou. It is the whole plan set up by the McCarthy Builders people. So it is a lot more um, intensive than you give it credit for. But the last thing that needs to happen is that whole plan has to come into play with the manpower, woman power, and the equipment. And if you don't do all three of those things, you aren't going to have the institution that you set up in 1961, which was to take care of ourselves and provide first-class medicine. Thank you very much. Ms. Younger, two minutes. So Tri-City is my family, my children, my family, my community's lifeline. My grandmother was just in the ER on Friday with a stroke. And I have to tell you, from working at hospitals across the country, we have a gem. Tri-City is a gem. We have fantastic physicians. We have great nurses. We do great care. And unfortunately, we have this horrific reputation because of the leadership and what's happening right now. We need a change. And I have to tell you, I'm a woman of few words, but what, what I do do is I roll up my sleeves and I get things done. And if, has anyone been to Inland Valley in, um, in, Mar in Marietta? Okay, so let me tell you, that's the hospital I just worked at. They make money hand over fist. Well, no hospital makes money hand over fist, but they make a profit. 
There's no reason we shouldn't be thriving. And we're, we're in a community that's thriving. This hospital should be thriving. And we will be thriving. And we will do well. We just need a leadership change. Well, thank you very much. And that concludes the evening. And I would like to thank you all for coming tonight. You too. By the way, Jim, I've seen him.